Thank you very much indeed, Dirk. Um, let's get on to the discussion quickly. Um, and I'll take um, both comments and questions, but try and limit yourself to sort of one point each, not too long, so that we give um, plenty of people an opportunity to engage. So who would like to kick off? Tom. Hi, thanks. Um, I just wanted to pick up um, points that the report raises on climate change. It wasn't uh, discussed too much, and but it's you know great to see that climate change is so front and centre within within the report and the recognition that this is an issue that very much changes the landscape. Um, however, I do think that the report focuses a little bit too heavily on reform of the LDCF. Um, the LDCF is a, you know, I think for, for people looking at the bigger climate finance picture is a very small part of that um, and has been you know pretty much hugely unsuccessful in attracting very large funding um, however I think it's probably more of a function of where we are in the climate finance picture at the moment rather than necessarily a, a fault of the report um, given that the advisory group on finance uh, reported on how to raise a hundred billion dollars a year um, only you know ten days or so ago um, but I think what we have learned from that and what I think least developed countries are probably learning from that is that the opportunities related to private finance flows are going to be considerable and the uh, finance flows outside the UNFCCC architecture uh, are likely to continue to be very large. Um, but very interestingly from last week, the, the um, presentation by Nick Stern um, that was given at the Andrew Mitchell talk on climate and development mentioned the opening of an African Green Fund uh, window and the possibility of an African Green Fund to complement the Copenhagen Green Fund. And I think this will be on the table in Cancun. So my, real, my, my question here is what, what do you think the impact would be of having a um, unified uh, Green Fund that would cover you know, large majorities of, of least developed countries, um, as well as marrying that to, to, to private finance flows. Okay. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, other questions? Please introduce yourself and comments. Joe Hanlon, a writer on Mozambique. I've used Charles' reports in much of what I've been writing, and of course, see the same story come up again and again. And so that's my question is, is anyone listening? Um, I write on Mozambique where the IMF, for instance, is actually trying to close down domestic investment by pushing up interest rates by requiring much larger reserves, where any attempt by the government to get involved in supporting productive sectors is stepped on really hard by the donor community, led by DFID. Um, is anybody listening? Thank you very much, Tom. Hi, thank you. Um, my name's Helen Hawthorne. Um, I had a couple of questions I wanted to ask, just for kind of clarification, really. Um, you mentioned that the report focuses on country ownership and the importance of it, but from kind of the readings that I've done on the LDC conferences, th what was different about them was the fact that they encouraged country ownership from the beginning and the countries were involved in their development plans um, and presented those to all of the um, LDC conferences. So just wondered if you could say what was, you know, what was different about this, how you were going to, con um, how you envisage country ownership being different this time. And the other point that I wanted to ask was about, um, you mentioned the Brussels Programme of Action. And one of the things that that was, to be judged on was the graduation of LDCs, um, and um, only Cap Verde has graduated out of the category in this decade. So, how does the um, this new uh, international development architecture deal with the issue of graduation going forward? Thank you. So, Thank you. not only do we have someone who's read the Brussels <laughs> Programme of Action, but I have a question on it as well. All those three are for you, Charles. Maybe if you can. Do you want to take those three? Yeah, okay. Um, in, in doing the report, you know, we had to, uh, I'm, I'm on the climate change one now. In doing the report, we had to kind of get a balance between the LDC specificity and the, and the global, you know, global changes. And um, 
you know, we, we actually have a, a long background paper which should be published, uh, you know, today when it's launched, which includes a, a very long discussion on the um, global architecture. Um, mm. Now, uh, you know, our judgment was, you know, we, sh we should, uh, you know, focus more on the LDC specificity there. Um, but you'll see in this background paper, you'll see a longer discussion on that, which is actually very critical about the sufficiency and the adequacy of this, uh, the sufficiency, sufficiency of funds and the adequacy. I, I'm not sure about this idea of a green fund, and, you know, I, I'm, um, you know, I, 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 I'm not, I, I, I don't have any, um, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't have any idea, idea what this African green fund looks like. Um, you, you know, in general, vertical funds can be counterproductive. Um, th they kind of highlight the issue, but then, you know, they, it, 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 um, it, it, it kind of um, disarticulates the kind of policy coherence at the, at the country level. So it, it's a question of how it works. Um, I, th I think the people in New York are perhaps thinking about uh, for this uh, Istanbul program of action. I think they're thinking about some kind of uh, climate change fund. I think they, you know, but I, I, we're not really, um, you know, looking at that. So, so we kind of focused on, you know, trying to make the existing things work better uh, more. Um, in reply to Joseph's question, is anyone listening? Um, I, I think they're listening more. Mm. I think they're listening more. But I think the surprising thing is how little the global financial crisis has um, led to a realization that we're at the end of an era, that we have to change things. It's, I, it, it's astounding to me, actually. It is astounding to me that... Um, and, and we put this on the cover saying, you know, the final crisis is like that. It's a financial earthquake, new beginning. But um, it is astounding, really, that, um, um, you know, that this is not being realized, that there is such inertia in practices. Mm -hmm. However, what I think is being realized, and, um, and uh, I think, you know, I heard the DAC, the new director of the DAC, John Lomoy, who is a Norwegian, talking about this, um, is that, you know, if you want to bring hundreds of millions of people out of poverty rather than bring thousands of people out of poverty, you've got to work on structural transformation. You have got to develop the productive capacities of a country. And I think, you know, we've been saying this since 2002, basically. And, you know, we actually did the first, you know, assessment of the PRSP process in 2000, the 2000 report, when we said it wasn't focused on growth sufficiently um, in 2000. And, but I think, you know, this notion that um, uh, you need to focus on production and employment is starting to get through. I think th the difficulty is, um, you know, there's all kinds of inertias in the system. And what we've got in this pro our proposals, I think they're a mix of actionable things and y more utopian things, you know. The actionable things, you know, and I'll come to ownership, you know, th th there are actionable things like the, the, the donors can start moving more aid into production sectors and infrastructure. That's easily actionable. You know, but things like taxing commodity derivatives, mm -hmm. you know, getting agreement on this, you know, contingency financing from what uh, Stephanie mm -hmm. is saying is now actionable, I would say, and you probably can get movement on that. It should probably not be an LDC specific thing, but it would help LDCs very much if you, we mm -hmm. got the the, the, the the kind of things you were mm -hmm. saying up to scale, non-conditionality. Mm -hmm. um, but I think all I can say, Joe, is I, th I, th I think, um, <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, I think there is progress being made. But uh, unfortunately, you know, this after the crisis, there, it, it's astounding. It's absolutely astounding that people don't realize, you know, that, you know, we started structural adjustment programs in 1982. You know, this is 30 years ago, you know, and we're, and we're living with you know, models of, of export-led growth which are based on studies in the 1960s when they started talking about outward-oriented 
uh, industrialization, you know, and, and here we are in, in, in the 2010s. It's, it's, it's a new world, and the climate change is part of the new world. You know, China and India are part of the new world, but, you know, the, the um, you know, how this will be inscribed in the Istanbul program, I don't know. When we get to country ownership, um, how will it be different? I, I, we, UNCTAD is not managing the, the um, UNLDC4 process. There is an office in New York which is, 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 uh, is, is managing it. Um, they haven't got, con I, I, don't, I don't think they've got country development strategies out of it, but they had regional meetings. Uh, when I was talking about country ownership, I, I was more thinking of it not as an LDC-specific issue, but rather as a, um, a, 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 an aspect of the global economic regime. And the point there is, uh, it's a, it was made in the last report rather than this report, but um, the point there is that the donors in the Paris de Declaration are not monitoring uh, country ownership in terms of national leadership. They monitor country ownership in terms of whether the countries put in place the financial mechanisms mm. through which you can account for the use of aid and whether they are, are putting in their targets related to global targets, i.e. MDGs. And this is, this is country ownership. You know? Country ownership is national leadership. They say in the Paris Declaration country ownership is national leadership, but they don't monitor it. <laughs> okay? And so it's a, kind of simple, it's a kind of simple thing. Now, in terms of graduation of, uh, of LDCs, um, you know, the whole architecture, we say, is one of the goals of the architecture is to kind of facilitate um, graduation of LDCs, which we think will occur um, um, through a focused on these inc more inclusive development paths. We think that will occur. Thank you very much. I want to go for one, one more round and then I'll go across the yeah. panel after that. A couple of quick comments. One is um, you can think of counter-cyclicality in terms of things reaching the country, but also in terms of what reaches people on the ground mm. who are suffering. And those are two very different issues in terms of delivery. But anyway, let's take another three. Sheila. Thank you. Uh, Sheila Page, ODI. On the question of architecture, you started with the defense of LDCs as a category, and I wanted to take you up on that. Because in a sense, uh, your answers to two of the questions in the last round were, but this isn't LDC specific. Mm. And the answer to a lot of the other points in your uh, presentation, notably the whole commodity question, are not LDC yeah. specific. Yeah. I mean, the only LDC specific issues are the, the legal ones, where LDC status gives you a legal right in the WTO to certain special privileges. But although the, there's a little bit about that in the report, and there will probably be a little bit about that in the conference, to me that is the only area where the LDC should be pressing, is possibly for getting legal obligations based on status into other categories, or alternatively saying for these other things it's better to be flexible and to have mm. problem-related categories. But you seem to be trying to have it both ways, and I yeah. don't quite see what the point is of LDCs on a lot of your issues. Interesting point. Adrian, quickly, and then we'll go over to this. Yeah, thanks. Um, um, Andy, very quickly, Adrian Hewitt, ODI. Um, on just on um, Charles's last point, I mean, graduation only happens if you do it, and they did finally seize the nettle and do it when you know Cape Verde started advertising properties in the Sunday Times, literally. Um, but to go to Tom's <laughs> point and say something a bit more helpful. Um, uh, Tom was suggesting that Andrew Mitchell even had been suggesting floating um, um, green funds uh, on, ma on the markets. And your own report, page 229, says, suggests green bonds issued by some least developed countries, and it goes so far as to name the ones, the African countries that could issue government bonds, Equatorial Guinea and Sudan. And of course, <laughs> exactly the answer to the point that the lady was making, that these countries should have graduated out long ago. I mean, Equatorial Guinea is fabulously rich. It misuses its money, but that's a governance <laughs> issue, and it's not to do with okay. bigger, least developed country. Thank okay, you. let's move on. We've, I want to take some from this side of the room. This Hi, um, my name is Shemi. I'm an international researcher from currently at Berkeley. Uh, just a couple of simple questions. Um, th there has been a recognition by the panel that uh, the um, pillar of the capitalist system, which is the financial system, has collapsed. 
um, and also the, the it, it, throughout this period the uh, LGCs have been resilient. So a couple of questions, why is that? And secondly, if that's the case, why are we imposing this model on uh, a f of a failed system on developing countries? And just another question, um, how much of, uh, of an input from low developing countries goes in these reports? Uh, or is it just another sort of diktat uh, that may turn out to be what, like the structure adjustment programs? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, one last question and then we'll see if we've got any on the internet. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Kimi Yakijin from uh, Japan International Cooperation Agency. And my question is related to this fiber agenda for action. I mean, the technology. Well, uh, you said that uh, technology is a relatively new concept, but how, how do you describe the difference between the conventional technical cooperation and uh, this uh, technology issues? Is my question. Yeah. Have we got anything on the internet, Liam? Any questions? Uh, from yeah, we've got a few on the internet. Oh, <laughs> 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 um, the first one from Clifford Headley, a development consultant in the UK. He says, uh, given that aid flows primarily through the structures of the state and given the volume of legal uh, capital outflows that features, uh, what features are proposed in new international development architecture to address these stress fractures? Um, there's another one from... Can you speak up a bit? Yeah, you, you I can't hear you. Oh, oh sorry. Shall I, shall I read that again? Yeah, I do. Okay. Uh, given that aid flows primarily through the structures of the state and given the volume of illegal capital outflows, uh, what features are proposed in the new international development architecture to address these stress factors? Uh, and Kingsley Egbuonu, uh, who is a postgraduate student at Queen Mary's, uh, says, how can developed countries defend claims that the current international framework on industrial property rights, including TRIPS, has not yielded any benefits to LDCs? Is it time to renegotiate and draft new measures to specifically address LDC needs in this respect? Okay. All right. Um, we'll maybe go from... Do you want to start this time, Dirk? We'll go across the table. Um, I think most of the questions were actually to Charles. Yeah, yeah. 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 So and the, the one thing that I suppose is, uh, that I'd like to highlight is the, sort of the country focus, I think, which, is very, uh, which remains very important. And I think you, you've done it before in other reports, perhaps, Charles, in the, the previous report, mm. or... Um, but at the, the starting point has to be the developing country policies, what they want um, and, uh, and, and need, and, um, uh, and in particular, so the, the growth policies that they like to, uh, to pursue, and, um, and then to provide us uh, the support for that. I think that is, uh, that's been, and those are highly heterogeneous needs. And uh, so we, we've got Bangladesh, which is just different from Haiti, which is different from Uganda, which is different from Lesotho. And they all meet different uh, different uh, support. So I think the one thing that piece that is is, is 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 important. The next piece is how do you sort of relate what is an option, uh, an offer, what are the, the, the menu of options, the ingredients, and uh, and then how do do the um, uh, can the country the countries themselves um, uh, get access to that uh, and uh, and turn it into uh, sort of uh, they are the cooks and then have their own recipes. Uh, and take the ingredients, basically, uh, rather than the other way around. Yeah. Um, Stephanie, do you want to go next? I'm yeah, thank Charles. you. Um, yeah, I want first to comment, actually, on something that, that Dirk had said earlier, and it's this issue of um, attracting more private business and developing business in, in, in the poorest countries. I mean, there is one level at which I very much agree which is, for example, how, and this links up also with the question on, on the green funds, uh, how does, there is actually a lot of long-term money in the world. There is a lot of pension fund money, insurance money, and there's now money in the sovereign wealth funds, which are actually mainly developing, so-called developing countries. It's China, it's Singapore, Saudi Arabia, and so on. Uh, also countries like Norway. So how do you, these people have, for uh, the clearest example, the Norwegian pension fund, which has a lot of billions of dollars, which they don't need at the moment. They will need for their future generations' pensions. 
And therefore, that is the kind of long-term money that we would need for investment in infrastructure, in investment in clean energy, and so on. And of course, this uh, very inappropriate private financial system that we have is very bad at, at kind of recycling from these long-term funds to these long-term needs. And I was actually at a very interesting conference, Sovereign Wealth Funds at Columbia, and, and that was one of the central subjects of discussion, how you could change the even the incentives, how people get paid and so on, how maybe the channeling could be done directly from Sovereign Wealth Funds and Pension Funds to, to these long-term needs without going through the kind of fund managers which will make it all three months, uh, speculative mm -hmm. and so on, which will then not be useful for development or for anything else, but just for them to make money. So I think that is a really important issue uh, from a development perspective and from a climate change perspective, because the money is actually there. And it's just a question of getting the, the mechanisms for channeling it right and getting it away from this kind of broadly perverse private financial system. And that's where perhaps I have some disagreement with Derek, because he said that I mean, I, I don't think any money is good, any private money is good. Because at the moment, actually, as I said before, uh, there's a lot of money being printed in the developed world, and, and it's going to developing countries through the carry trade because they have higher interest rates. So countries like Uganda are actually desperate. They're getting so much portfolio investments to fund their government debt that they they don't want it. They, they're all studying Chilean capital controls. Hmm. Um, and, and, and the Asian countries are desperate. And, and if they close mm -hmm. down one route, they come in through derivatives. So th there is that issue of how you deal with hot money, um, mm -hmm. which is also to prevent that we have another crisis three or four years in the developing countries, which is like the last thing we want. Secondly, I just wanted to just a little bit on what, what Charles said. I think it's very true what he said that, that answering your question, what, you know, how slow the response, how much inertia there is in amongst the economics profession, amongst the policy makers. I mean, there was, I think, a very positive reaction at the beginning. There was a sort of very Keynesian response, both in the macro policies of developed countries in, in the policy space, they're open to developing countries, and some of them just took, like the Chinese. Um, in, the, um, in the support which the international community institutions like the bank and the fund gave. But now, I think it's quite scary because there's a step back, and particularly in Europe. You know, there is mm -hmm. this pressured by the markets and by some very conservative governments, I would say, particularly the German one, uh, there, there is a step back as if all this Keynesianism has been forgotten, and there's this very conservative fiscal uh, uh, attitude, which I think will, will lead to a sharp slowdown uh, in Europe. Stephanie, thank you very much. Just a, a quick comment, which is there was actually a huge... Oh, uh, I had one more sentence. Sorry. Can I just allow yeah. one more sentence? And one concern that I have, which I'm not sure whether I'm, I'm, I am justified or not, is that this increased fiscal conservatism, which is spreading in Europe and also in the United States, actually, within the Republican Congress, doesn't spread through the international institutions, isn't imposed again on, on developing countries. Because that, that, that could be even more serious. It's interesting. There was actually a huge swing in IBRD lending in the bank towards the productive sectors over the last four to five years. So uh, it's not true that there's been no reaction on that. Mm -hmm. um, figures are quite striking. I mean, a huge shift into that area. And it's interesting it was middle income, mm. mostly, rather than either. But anyway, yeah. Char yeah. Charles, um, we're running over slightly. Yeah. Apologies for that. Yeah. But Charles, okay. there's plenty for you to OK, chew well, on, so. uh, if I can uh, just clarify um, um, the, 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 the Dirk's point, um, I, I think on, on um, Y y the starting point for everything of the whole architecture is that the countries themselves take the lead in the design of their development strategies. That's, I think that's the starting point. We don't talk very much in this report about national policies because the last report was entitled The State mm -hmm. and Development Governance, and that was essentially looking at the national policies. But the starting point is uh, the, the, the countries themselves um, uh, design uh, you know, their own uh, uh, development strategies. And our colleague over there asked, how much input do we get from developing countries? Well, um, 
we've kind of uh, discussed our ideas with um, you know in in various dissemination workshops in in LDCs, um, and um, essentially you know they're very much in favour of our focus on production and employment. Um, what they are, uh, you know, are concerned about is how you do this, and, and this is this is the point where, uh, you know, disagreements are starting. But I'd like to, you know, clarify: we, 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 the, the base of the whole thing is developing developing country ownership, LDC ownership, and also um, we do believe in investment as being the heart of the process, as well as innovation and diversification out of commodities. Um, in relation to Sheila's question, I think this is. Um, you know, a critical issue. What's the balance between the global economic regimes and the LDC-specific uh, support mechanisms? The, the LDC-specific support mechanisms, if you like, can be seen as a form of affirmative action for the poorest countries. That, it, that it's, it's, like a f it's, it's like a form of a affirmative action which is near in required for the poorest members of the international community. Um, we are we are arguing that, um, it, and this is partly the political context of the conference. The LDCs themselves are focusing specifically on that, and and we're saying that that's not enough. In some sense, you've got to put it within the context of these global economic regimes. But we do believe that some forms of affirmative action are necessary, as well as the reforms in the global economic regime. And we also would argue that they have to go beyond legal rights. I think um, you need f finance and institutions related to the legal rights in order to uh, make a difference. Um, Adrian is talking about the graduation issue, and I think this is important because um, I, I, I sense from both of you that you're skeptical of the LDCs as a category. Um, and I think I, you know, I believe in the category, but I think there are perhaps classification issues in relation to who's in and who's out. And there are certainly problems, as you are referring to, Adrian, in terms of getting graduated out of the category. And I think um, the wider recognition of the category probably requires a closer look at the classification of who's in and who's out, but um, in my view, that the you know that it's it's a it's a kind of marginal issue. There are a few cases, and they're kind of horrific cases, as you as you mentioned. But I, I, I you know I I wouldn't see it as as um, as as undermining the idea of the, uh, of the category of a set of countries, um, you know, which are uh, have structural weaknesses, which mean they lag behind. There is a very good book by Patrick Guillaume, which is looking at this issue uh, in, in some detail. Um, JICA, what's the difference between technical cooperation and, and technology? When we talk about technology, we're, we're thinking about um, how does the international community support uh, technological upgrading at the enterprise level? Technical cooperation is often you know, government to government uh, advice. And that also refers to one of the email questions. You know, we, in in the finance pillar, we would argue that there is a need for more innovative uses of aid rather than just state-to-state -state transfers, and specifically innovative uses of aid for private sector development. But I think I'd like to conclude by saying, um, you know, what we're trying to do here is we we do believe that new thinking is required. We do believe we've got to go beyond business as usual. And we need a kind of an international architecture which releases the creative potential of these countries and doesn't see them solely in terms of humanitarian need. And uh, this, we believe, um, requires um, changes in global economic regimes, but also uh, a, an improvement uh, of existing uh, international support measures and in indeed the introduction of a new generation of, of international support mechanisms for LDCs focused more on productive capacities. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Interesting. I think the theme of um, 
resistance and inertia suggests that any new architecture will have to come about by stealth. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but thank you all very much, in particular thanks to the panel. <laughs>